We are in uh, chapter three. Real quick question. It's October. How many birthdays in October? Raise your hand. One uh, over here. Anybody over here? A few. Yeah. Where'd she go? Oh. So today is Elizabeth's birthday. Yay. Happy birthday. Yeah. I was going to sing happy birthday to her, but she said, please don't. And I said, okay, that's good. But it's good to have all of you here with us this morning. I won't say how old she is, but she's officially three years younger than me today. So, chapter 3, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, this morning as we come to the fifth letter to the, the seven churches, we have one of the saddest letters that Jesus writes here. Um, it's commonly known, and some of your headings in your Bible might say the dead church. Usually we think of a dead church as a, a place you go where the building is old and dilapidated, or the people are old and dilapidated. Uh, and that can be the case at some, you know, in some places. But what we see from this letter is that many dead churches are dead because of not their outward appearance, you know, on the outward side, they look very much alive. They have all kinds of different activities and programs going on. But Jesus' perspective is they're dead, uh, spiritually dead, to the things of the Lord. And we'll see why as we go through this letter. They look like a Christian church, but they're just going through the motions. <clears throat> Again, there's three, sometimes four ways to look at these letters. There's the historical church back in the first century. The church of Sardis was existing, you know, it was there. Um, prophetically, each one of these churches represents a time frame during the church age from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. And then the third way to look at these letters is to ask ourselves, how does our church measure up? How do I measure up to what Jesus is saying? Because he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's that personal application. Uh, the city of Sardis had an interesting history. It was built on a high hill, and there was only one entrance into the city. And so they're very self, uh, you know, secure, and, you know, among themselves, they thought, oh, nobody's going to break in here. And it was hard to break in because they, all you had to do was place guards at that one entrance. But twice in their history, they were overcome. They were overwhelmed by uh, soldiers, uh, Cyrus, King Cyrus, sent his soldiers in in uh, 549 B.C., and then Antiochus in uh, 218 B.C. How did they break into that city? The guards fell asleep. So we just saw Jesus tells them to wake up. They need to be watching. They need to be, you know, on guard. And so that's what Jesus is referring to. Sardis started off as a very prosperous city. At one point, it was the capital of the territory of Lydia. But over time, it slowly began to decline. And then in 17 AD, it was totally leveled by an earthquake. It wiped out the city. Uh, Caesar Tiberius rebuilt the city, but it continued to decline. Uh, Sardis was located 30 miles from Thyatira, as we looked at last time. Um, Thyatira represents the dark ages of the church, and we'll see that this represents the Reformation here in a moment. But at one point in their history, Sardis was under the authority of Thy Thyatira, and they broke away. They escaped. Sardis means the escaped ones. It can also mean the remnant, and we'll see how that lines up with the order that Jesus picks of these seven churches. But whenever people spoke of Sardis, 
They would say things like, oh, Sardis, what a beautiful place that used to be. Oh, Sardis, what a wonderful history. It used to be so alive, so vibrant. Those were the good old days. And, you know, we hear that in Calvary Chapel at times. Oh, the 70s, man, the Jesus movement. Those were the good old days. It's not always a compliment. As we look at Jesus' letter to this church, it's pretty much the same. It's a church that is being remembered only because of its past reputation with the Lord. It's a church where Jesus is known by name, but they were essentially ignoring him. And as we'll see, their heart was no longer beating for Christ. In fact, Jesus is going to have a hard time finding a pulse with this church. Notice how he addresses them again in verse 1. And the angel, the messenger of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now there's a lot in this verse. First of all, Jesus knows um, their condition. He's the great physician. You know, he knows when people have broken hearts, broken lives. He knows when people, you know, are dead in their sins. He knows how to heal people that, you know, have different issues, diseases. But especially, he is great at healing the worst disease of all, which is sin. Now, What's his diagnosis of this church? Well, she's spiritually dead to the Lord, and he's about to have her life support unplugged. He says, you have a name that you're alive, but I say you are dead. Now, that is not what you want to hear Jesus say to any of you. Prophetically, again, Sardis represents the time in church history from about 1500 A.D. to the present time. Just as Sardis escaped the authority of Thyatira, it was in the 1500s that the Protestant Reformation took hold, and that's when they broke away from the Church of Rome. And they were under the authority of the Church of Rome for so many years. The Reformation was one of the most amazing times in church history. Literally millions of people were radically saved. They were changed during this a uh, short time in church history, God used men like, you know, John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, John Knox, Martin Luther, and many, many others to help set the masses free from all the rules, rituals, regulations that they were previously under because of the Church of Rome. It was during the Reformation that something wonderful and powerful began to take place, and that was the Word of God was basically discovered by the people, because these great reformers started translating the Bible into the language of the common people. Remember what I mentioned last week, the popes made it illegal for anybody to own a Bible, they made it illegal for anybody to read the Bible, the only person that could read and interpret it were the Catholic priests, and so the people were in darkness, that's why it's called the Dark Ages, but during the time of the Reformation, God's word started spreading among the people, and they started coming into a loving, living relationship with Christ. And it was because they were hearing the gospel of Christ for the very first time. And that's when they realized Jesus paid the price in full. Jesus died on the cross for my sins once and for all. Jesus is the one who rose from the dead. And because he's alive, he can give us everlasting life. And so they learned to put their faith alone in Christ alone. And they quickly realized the church cannot save you. Keeping the sacraments cannot save you. Indulgences do nothing for you. And they realize, you know, all these things were just man's religion. But Jesus offers the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will simply believe in him, put their faith and trust in him as Lord and Savior. So the rallying cry of the Reformation, many of you know, was the just shall live by faith. Bottom line. And so when the Reformation caught fire and spread, it was truly one of the greatest times within the history of the church. But, and here's the sad reality of the Reformation, what started off as such a powerful move of the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God and transforming the people of God were, were the flames of um, renewal and repentance and uh, just that regeneration were burning bright and hot. Within a relatively short time, those flames began to dwindle down to a few warm coals. And the simple explanation is this. Once those reformers started to die off, 
the people started taking all of their great sermons and all of their great writings, and they started to condense them into all these creeds and all these different confessions. And so you would have one group of people saying, well, we think this creed is better than your creed, and this confession is better than your confession. And they had all these different things going on, and they reduced what those reformers started into all these different creeds and confessions. And like I said, one group would say, well, we hold to the Augsburg Confession. Well, we hold to the Heidelberg Confession. Well, we hold to the 39 Articles. Well, we hold to, you know, the, the Formula of Concord. And in and of themselves, you know, those things weren't really bad. It, it just condensed the Christian faith into some simple phrases that were still, you know, very powerful, uh, very useful. But the problem is they got away from the Word of God they stopped walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they thought, well, we just have these creeds. We have these reformers' writings, and they started to build their lives on those things rather than building their life on the Word of God in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus is coming against them, because they were putting their hope in just these things of men, even though they're good things, but it was not the Word of God. Um, my mom was a sad example of this, and she didn't get saved until after my dad passed away when she was 70 years old, and I got to lead her to Christ, and I got saved um, just before I turned 21, so she would have been mid-40s or so, and uh, after I got saved, you know, I'd come home from school, she'd be passed out drunk. She'd use the Lord's name all the time in vain, and so when I got saved, it's like, Mom, you need Jesus. Her response was always the same. No matter how, she could be drunk, she could be sober. Mom, you need to ask Christ into your life. And she goes, you know what, I, I know the Apostles' Creed. And so she would just recite it. She knew it. She had this in her brain, not in her heart. So she would say in, in about this tone, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, which is the universal church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. That's what she would tell me. It's like, but you don't even know what that means. You have no idea what you just recited to me. Again, it was all head knowledge, but she did not know Jesus. And then she finally got saved again when she was 70 years old. And then she realized, man, I had my faith and trust in anything and everything but Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That is what happens with these people at this time. They start to get away from that life in Christ the truth of God's word, and they start building their lives and all these doctrines of men, many of these things. And so, just as the Reformation caught fire and grew for about a 40-year period, just as quickly it started to dwindle down and die off. And if you go to anywhere in Europe today, and I've been over there a few times, and you can see these beautiful churches all built in the 1500s. In Sweden, when we were there for our daughter's wedding years ago, almost every village, every town you go to, this beautiful big church. They could seat anywhere from 500 to 1,500 people, and they were dead. They were closed up. They were either museums, or even if any were still open, they'd have an attendance of like 15 people. I mean, it was sad. But most of them are turned into museums or mausoleums. Or they've many in England turned into mosques for the Islamic people. I mean, it's just, it's sad. But you'll find it all over Europe. All these beautiful churches today, it costs multi millions of dollars to build these places, but they are just tourist attractions. They have a name, as Jesus says here, they're once alive, but he says, you are dead. They just have a remembrance of their glorious past. And even many of the offspring of these churches and the denominations that came out of the Reformers are pretty much dead in Jesus' eyes. And that's because many of these churches are embracing the culture of the wicked world around us. There's one marriage in God's book, husband, wife, 
That equals marriage. There are two sexes that God created, male and female. When churches start, and many of these churches are today, buying into the woke culture, well, you can identify as whatever you want. You can be a zebra. Yeah, yeah we'll go with that. It's like, no, you're denying what God's word says. He created you in his image and likeness, not in the image and likeness of a four-footed creature. But be that as it may, it's very sad to see where so many of the woke have gone to in churches today. And Jesus will say, you don't need to be woke. You need to wake up. You're dead. You're following after all these philosophies of men rather than the word of God. And so even in verse 1, Jesus gives us the solution to a church and a solution for us as individuals as to how to be revived because you have been letting, letting the coals burn out, so to speak. He wants to see us back to life, burning hot and bright once again. So look at verse 1. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Again, how does Jesus reveal himself spiritually to this dead church? He's the one who has the seven spirits of God. He's the one who has the seven stars. We saw in chapter 1, verse 20, the seven stars are these seven pastors, angelos, messengers in his hand. But then in chapter 1, verse 4, we saw that the seven spirits of God represents the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The number seven in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, means fullness or completeness. It's used 54 times in the book of Revelation. So the seven spirits of God represents the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So here Jesus comes to this church that's dead. And he says the only remedy for a cold, stiff, dying church that is, you know, what it needs is the life-giving, life-sustaining breath of God, the Holy Spirit to come back to life. And we have a great illustration of that. They need spiritual mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And a great picture of this is found in the book of Genesis. Remember when God made Adam out of the dirt? This is what we're, we read in Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. That's when he came alive, spiritually, to the Lord. They were in fellowship because of the breath of God, the Holy Spirit being breathed into his life. Another example, after Jesus rose from the grave, this is Resurrection Sunday evening. This is before he ascends up into heaven, before the day of Pentecost, John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. So Jesus said to them again, his disciples, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then, uh, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It was at that moment they were born again. The Holy Spirit came into their lives at that moment. In Luke's Gospel, it says that's when they understood the Scriptures. You can't understand the Bible. You can't understand what God is doing unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It was at that very moment they were brought to spiritual life, and the same is true for any of us. The only way that we can keep from burning out and growing stiff and cold is to be reignited by the Holy Spirit. The only way the Word of God stays fresh and alive within our hearts is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, if you're not, the Word of God seems boring, the Word of God seems legalistic, but it brings life into us when we walk in the power of the holy spirit we need to allow the holy spirit to continually move within us come upon us as believers john chapter 7 verse 37 on the last day that great day of the feast which is the feast of tabernacles jesus stood and cried out if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, unfortunately, as believers, and this is where a lot of Christians uh, stumble, this is where a lot of Christians get tripped up, 
we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit within us as Christians. He's in us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Just like Jesus says, he'll never leave us or forsake us. But there's things we can do in our flesh that grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. We can restrict the flow of living water when we walk in pride or hatred instead of walking in humility and love. Um, you know, I don't know, you, you know, are there rivers of living water flowing in and out of my life? Or, or am I just a drip, <laughs> drip, drip? Spirit's in you. Is he flowing through you? We can restrict the moving of the Holy Spirit within us when we strive in our own power to make things happen instead of waiting on the Lord. And this is where a lot of, you'll see a lot of how-to books in Christian bookstores. We don't have those here, hopefully. Uh, we don't want those here because there's so many how-to books. How to, you know, do this. How to do that. And they turn it into a formula. That's kind of what happened with the Reformers' writings. They turn these things into a formula. And so you'll see these things, how to have victory over whatever it might be. And it's always some formula that you got to come up with. Instead of denying yourself, taking up your cross, dying to your flesh, and following Jesus. You see throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites, they presumed on the Lord. They'd have this great victory over the enemy. And then the next time, they would just march into battle thinking, we'll just do the same thing we did last time. Surely God's going to give us the victory. Remember Jericho? They cross into the promised land, march around the city, you know, seven times, blow the trumpet, shout, you know, and, and the walls fall down. Then they come to the little town of Ai. Oh, yeah, we got this. Send in some troops. And they got wiped out. The Israelites did. They presumed on the Lord. They did things their way instead of doing things God's way and relying on the Lord daily. Not just thinking, well, this is what we did back then, so we'll do the same thing today and have the same victory. That's not how God operates. You know, Jesus doesn't heal everybody the same way. How does he, you know, heal blind eyes? Different ways. Sometimes he would say, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Sometimes he'd, you know, spit on the ground, make mud, and throw it in their eyes. Now go wash in the pool of Siloam. Sometimes he would just touch their eyes and they're healed. I mean, he didn't do it the same way. And so don't presume, oh, we had victory in this area, so I'm going to do the exact same thing and expect the same results, and you're leaving God behind. we got to be careful that we don't just presume on the Lord. Here's a great verse. It's in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. When it says not by might, that refers to individual strength. It's not by your individual strength that you're going to overcome whatever sin you're dealing with. It's not by might, nor by power. The word power is in this collective sense. We just need to get more people together, and then we'll do this thing for God. He says, no, it's not by yourself individually. It's not by getting more people involved that's going to be victorious. But by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, he can use you individually. He can use groups. But don't just say, we just need to get more people. We can need more people to march around Grand Junction. Really? If God calls you to do that, do it. Don't just think, well, they did it years ago. We'll do it today. Make sure God's in whatever you do. Now, when it comes to quenching the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul simply says, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. How do we quench the Spirit? Or, or in other words, how do we put a wet blanket over the Holy Spirit within us? Well, in the context of those verses, if you look at before and after that, it's denying the present ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's denying that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. If you deny that His gifts are needed in your life today, then you are going to quench the Spirit because without the Spirit giving you wisdom, discernment, whatever it might be, if you're just going to presume, I know what's best, you're quenching the Spirit. Many Christians relegate the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the first century church, but instead of relying on the Holy Spirit to lead us and empower us and give us wisdom and discernment, we start turning to worldly ideas and programs and methods to lead us. And, and I get things all the time, how to grow your church. And they use some Madison Avenue technique 
How'd you get people to give more money? And they use these Madison Avenue techniques, and it's just manipulation. And if you do this, we'll guarantee you'll have 50% more. I mean, it's garbage because they're presuming on the Lord. They're saying, you do these worldly things, and God's going to use it. No, God will lead us and guide us by his Holy Spirit. When it comes to grieving the Holy Spirit, Paul says this, Ephesians 4, verse 30. And this is to the church of Ephesus. He says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Again, he's speaking to those who are sealed by the Spirit. You're born again, but we can still grieve the Spirit. How do we do that? Well, just read chapters 4 and 5 of Ephesians. He's got this big old long extended list of bad attitudes, sinful actions, that if we get involved with, we will quickly grieve the Holy Spirit within us. And it won't take very long if we continue to grieve the Holy Spirit for us to start feeling spiritually weak, spiritually tired, powerless. And if that's where you are today, Jesus tells you, as he will tell the people of Sardis, you need to repent. He tells Christians five times in five of these letters to repent. Stop living life your way. Stop striving in the weakness of your flesh to try to change your life, but turn back to Jesus and start doing things His way, according to His Word, and that's when you'll find yourself walking in His will for your life. Otherwise, you're going to just be trying to do it in your own strength. Only then will you have genuine joy and peace in your heart and mind that the Holy Spirit gives you. It's only when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us up overflowing once again that he, will, that he will empower us to live our lives in such a way that the world around us will see more of Jesus in us, working through us, and less of us. It's like the, you know John the Baptist. i got to decrease so Jesus increases. And that's a principle for all of us. i got to get out of the way. I need to let the Holy Spirit work in me and through me so the world sees more of the Lord and less of me. Because I know what an idiot I can be. Don't forget the Holy Spirit enables us and empowers us to do so much more than we could ever do in our own strength. In our own strength, we, you know, we wither. We, we get you know, afraid. We, we lack boldness when we share the gospel with people. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do above and beyond anything we could hope or imagine. Acts 1.8, Jesus tells us, you know, his weak, weary disciples there on the, before the day of Pentecost, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we need the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. If you're a believer, you're a genuine believer, you're born again, the Spirit is always in you. But only again, you know, is the Spirit on me? Is He upon my life? In other words, are there rivers of living water? As you go through the book of Acts, time and time again, you'll see, it'll say, um, being filled with the Spirit. Peter did this and that. This was after the day of Pentecost. Being filled with the Spirit. Peter did these things. Being filled with the Spirit. Paul did these things. We need to be refilled constantly. D.L. Moody was asked, why do you keep talking about being refilled? He said, because I leak. And we do. You know, if we walk in the flesh, we're quenching, grieving. We need to be overflowing with rivers of living water. We receive power from the Holy Spirit to do what we cannot do in our own strength. Again, proclaiming the gospel to those who need to hear the good news instead of like, oh, I'm too afraid to talk to that person. They might think this about me or that. And we need the Holy Spirit to motivate us. And he gives us boldness. He gives us love for the lost. He gives us that confidence that if we just speak the truth of God's word, proclaiming the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts. I can't convince anybody, but God working in me and through me can do amazing things. And so we can come alongside of those who are hurting, those who are struggling, because they've been beaten down by this life, by this world. But he gives us that compassion. Otherwise, if we're in the flesh, we're like, yeah, they're getting what they deserve, and just move on. Instead of having that true love and compassion for those brothers and sisters that are really hurting and struggling. 
Paul's admonition of the Galatians, it's true for churches like Sardis, it's true for churches like us, or for any church that is lacking and, and, and you know the power of the Spirit, they're, they're relying on their own strength. This is what he says in Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? That's exactly what Sardis was doing. They were trying to perfect themselves in their own strength. They started off with hearts on fire, but now their heartbeat is about to stop. But the good news is Jesus, as a great physician, can do open heart surgery on anyone. And maybe your heart has stopped beating. Well, call out to the Lord. He's like the doctor that comes with the paddles, you know, clear. <clears throat> He can do that spiritually to any of us. But the key is you go through scriptures, you look down history, the key to any great revival is always the same. They had simple faith and trust in Jesus. They put their faith in him alone. They had faith and trust in proclaiming the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they knew God was going to use the gospel to change people's lives. And personally, they all yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. Instead of trying to make it happen, they allowed the Lord to work in them and through them, and God made it happen. Now look at verses 2 and 3, because Jesus gives them and us Again, the great physician gives us five simple things. You might call these prescriptions that the Lord has. This is his remedy for spiritual health. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. They're ready to die, for have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. So again, first thing he says is be watchful. That means be ready, be alert, wake up. Again, this church in Sardis knew exactly what Jesus meant. That's how their city was conquered when they fell asleep. Instead of guarding the city, being watchful, they fell asleep and they were conquered. Paul gives us some great verses about this very thing in our own lives. Romans chapter 13. I encourage you to write these down. Starting in verse 11, Paul says, Nearly 2,000 years ago, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And we're 2,000 years nearer to the final aspect of our salvation when we enter into glorification with the Lord. He says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust. Again, he's speaking to Christians here. Not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So be watchful. What's the second thing he tells them and us? Strengthen the things which remain. In other words, start strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it all boils down to, you and your personal relationship with Christ. Like Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, we need to get back to that first love relationship. Remember what he told them. You're doing all these great things, but I have this one thing against you. You left your first love. That's that intimate relationship that he desires to have with us. He says, get back to that. Here he says, strengthen the things which remain. The church of Sardis was just going through the motions. That's what Jesus means when he says, I have not found your works perfect before me. The word perfect means complete, it means mature. In other words, these things this church was doing were seen by Jesus as being half-hearted. A lot of times we go through the motions. We're just being half-hearted in our worship, in our Bible study. Oh, yeah, i got to do my morning devotions. Oh, let me get another cup of coffee. This is boring. Okay, Lord, I got through it. Bless my day. Thank you. Bye. That's half-hearted. 
He wants us to be fed by the Word of God. He wants us to be involved in ministry with Him. He wants to fill our hearts overflowing. These things are not pleasing to the Lord. You know, think of all the unbiblical, woke things, again, that are being promoted in so many churches today. It's not just the world. It's not just Disneyland. You know, it's not just these big companies. It's coming into the church. And it's so sad. Nowhere do we find the Word of God supporting or encouraging sinful, worldly philosophies of the unsaved world around us to be promoted in the house of God. Paul says this is the house of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of truth. The Word of God, that's our foundation. Jesus is the ultimate foundation. We're to build on Him not the woke things of this world. So strengthen the things which remain. Don't start grabbing other things to add to the mix. No, strengthen the most important things that he has given us. Acts 2.42, Apostles' Doctrine, Word of God, Fellowship, Breaking Bread, and Prayer. The third thing he says, here's this third remedy or prescription in verse 3, remember Therefore, how you have received and heard. Remember to the church of Ephesus, he said, remember where you have fallen. And here he says, remember how you received, how you heard. Remember how you first got saved. Do you remember when you first asked Jesus to save you? You called out to him. You were dead in your sins. Like, Lord, I'm going to perish for eternity. I need you. In that moment when he comes into your life, do you remember how you have received and heard? I think it would benefit each one of us to look back once in a while and remember how glorious it was when we first got saved or when we first realized, I'm saved because of his amazing grace. Not because of anything I could do, but it's because of his amazing grace. Do you remember the joy, uh, the peace the excitement that flooded into your heart when Jesus saved you? I mean, I do. November 30th, 1977. Calvary Chapel, San Diego. I don't remember the exact time. It was probably about 8 o'clock that evening. It was a Wednesday night. But when I went forward, I mean, I felt like I was three feet off the ground. You know, just the weight of sin just coming off of me. I mean, I was a new creation in Christ. I went from cussing like a sailor to that moment. I didn't cuss anymore. I didn't drink anymore. I didn't do all these things I was doing at San Diego State. And people thought, you're nuts. All my so-called friends said, we don't want to be around you. What's gotten into you? Jesus. Well, that's why they didn't want to be, be around me. Count the cost. Jesus. Do you remember when the creator of the entire universe actually loved you? And you realize Jesus died on the cross for you? And he shed his blood for your sins. And he, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. I'll dine with him and he with me. I know that's about Laodicea coming into the dead church there, but he comes into our lives. He wants a personal relationship with us. He saved you. And you realize, I'm forever free and forgiven. Paul tells the Philippians, Forget those things which are behind and press for the mark of the prize that we're calling God in Christ Jesus. That's in the context of don't live in the past of your sins and failures because Satan wants to remind you of all that to keep you wallowing in the mire. But Paul doesn't want you to you know, wallow in the mire. He wants you to set your mind on things above where Jesus is. Move forward with the Lord. But when Jesus says, think back, remember, it's always because of the goodness, the grace the love, the compassion that Jesus bestowed upon you. Remember that. Don't lose track of how awesome and amazing God is. Satan wants you to live in the past failures, but God says, no, you're a new creation in Christ. Let's keep moving forward. But don't forget what Jesus did for you in saving a wretch like you and me. The fourth thing Jesus tells us here is hold fast. Hold fast to Jesus. Hold fast to the Word of God. Hold fast to your faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep encouraging one another. Hold on to the truth of the gospel. Use the gifts and talents He's given you to help spread the gospel. 
We want to continue to teach the Word of God. We want to continue to see people growing in their relationship with the Lord. We want to strengthen the body of Christ so they can reach out to others. So it's always important to reevaluate our lives from time to time, make sure that we're letting go of empty, worthless things. Remember how Paul says, put off to the Christians in Ephesus, to the Christians in Philippi, in, Coloss in, in the church in Colossae, put off these things as believers, works of the flesh. Put on tender mercies. Put on love. Keep you know, grabbing on to these things of the Lord. Hebrews 10, 23. The ladies are going to start Hebrews this week. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We see so many young people, especially, you know, college age kids. They, they grew up in the church and so many fall away because they're not holding fast to the confession of their faith, their hope in Christ. When they get to colleges, they let these stinking professors professing to be wise. They became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into a glory like corruptible man, four-footed creatures, all these creepy crawlies. And they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We need to hold fast to the truth of God's word, the promises he has given us. And then the fifth thing that Jesus prescribes, again, to five of the seven churches, repentance. He simply says, repent. This is Christianity 101. If you find yourself going in the wrong direction, turn around and start going in the right direction. That's all repentance means. You stop doing what is contrary to God's word and you simply start going towards the Lord and what his word says. Seeing things from God's viewpoint, turning from the evil, doing things God's way. Again, he tells us to repent not because he's angry with us, but he wants us to experience a closer, more intimate relationship with him. He doesn't want anything to be a barrier between us and in intimacy with him. He wants us to drop whatever baggage of this world is weighing us down and just be free in Christ. Remember what Paul, uh, Peter says, cast all your cares upon him, Jesus, because he cares for you. Don't think you're going to carry all these hard things in this life and I'm going to do it on my own. No, just lay it at the foot of the cross. He just wants you to experience that peace, that joy that comes, well, Acts 3.19, Peter tells us that we experience refreshing that comes through the, the, the presence of the Lord when we repent. When we stop doing it our way, start doing things His way. So again, five simple things to be aware of. Be watchful. Strengthen your relationship with Christ. Remember the grace and goodness of God. Hold fast to Jesus and His Word. And whenever needed, humble yourself before the Lord and repent. Get right. Get get on the right track with Jesus once again. Now look at the second part of verse three. He says, "Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you." Now again, this city, this church, they knew all about this. They were overcome and conquered because the guards fell asleep when they should have been watching and ready. Now, whenever I read about Jesus coming as a thief in the night, I immediately think of the rapture of the church because he's coming in an hour nobody is waiting for. He's coming in an hour nobody knows. He's going to come when he's going to come. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, but the rapture of the Lord's church and the second coming of Christ are two very, very distinct, different events. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride. At the second coming of Christ, he comes back to earth with his bride. At the rapture, everything is going to be on planet earth, kind of business as usual. If you think this is business as usual in the world we live in today, but it, you know Jesus says he'll be marrying, he'll be giving in marriage. It's like the days of Noah before the flood, life going on as usual. But at the second coming of Christ, there's nothing you know usual happening. This world will be on the brink of total annihilation at the second coming of Christ. After all the wrath of God and the destruction of mankind and Satan and the demons let loose, this world will be on the brink of total destruction. 
at the rapture, Jesus will catch us up into the presence with the other saints in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, Jesus comes with the clouds of saints and angels as he returns to earth. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 24. We saw this a few months ago. Verse 40, Jesus talks about these very things. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. And some commentators say, oh yeah, they're taken to destruction. It's like, no, the Greek word for taken is paralambano. I went through this when we went through that section. It means to be brought near in association and intimacy. So one will be taken into a place of intimacy with the Lord. That's the rapture. Those left behind are going to be left behind to face the great tribulation. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. We know exactly when Jesus is coming at his second coming. Daniel gives us the time frame, 1,290 days after the abomination of desolation. Three and a half years later. But we don't know when the rapture is going to take place. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and had not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Again, the rapture could happen at any moment. There's no Bible prophecies that need to be fulfilled for the rapture to take place. Uh, quickly, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, something that was once hidden but now has been revealed. That's mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He says the same thing there in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the dead in Christ will rise first, that we who are alive and remain, when the rapture takes place, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus is telling those within the church who are not watching, in other words, they're not, you know, they're not walking with the Lord. They're not born again. They're just church goers. That when he comes for his bride, they will be left behind. And I've often wondered. I mentioned this last week. Who's going to show up the first Sunday after the rapture? You don't want to be in that group. Hopefully not a group. You don't want to be showing up and everybody's like, hey, what happened? Look at verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis. So there's genuine believers in these churches who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white white garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels and so these are amazing promises from Jesus to all of his genuine brothers and sisters who are truly saved and even in this church of Sardis they have some believers who are truly saved who are walking with him he says in white garments what are the white garments well that's their robes that uh, we receive for the wedding We'll be clothed in white linen, fine and clean. We'll see this in chapter 19. It's Jesus wrapping his robes of righteousness around us. He gives us white garments. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, that's God the Father, made him his son Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he's going to wrap his robes of righteousness around us. Then notice what he says here of his saints, for they are worthy. The word worthy there means suitable or acceptable. It does not mean that we've made ourselves suitable or acceptable or holy or righteous, but it's all because we are new creations in Christ. Again, this is a picture of the Lord's bride being clothed in white garments, pure and clean. But we'll see more of that in chapter 19. The awesome promise from Jesus is, take note of that in verse 5 once again, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Don't ever look at that as a threat. 
Like Jesus is just waiting for you to mess up one more time. He's got his cosmic eraser out. And there you go. That's not what he's saying at all. Jesus is making a promise to those who have truly trusted and turned their life over to Christ that he will never erase our names from his book of life. The Bible mentions other books. We don't have time to look at them all, but you can look up Psalm 56, verse 8. It talks about the Lord stores up our tears in a bottle. Also, he stores up our tears in a book. Malachi 3.16 says there's a book of remembrance. We'll see in Revelation 13.8, he speaks of the Lamb's book of life. In Revelation 20, it says other books were opened. In other words, God keeps meticulous records, probably videos. <laughs> he used to say, you know, cassette recordings. No, it's a little more advanced than that. But the promise here is in the double negative. Jesus is literally saying, I will no not ever blot out your name from the book of life. That sounds like a, you know eternal security to me. You know, he's not going to blot out your name if you're truly born again. If you're not, your name's not in there, I guess. This is what Jesus says in John 10, verse 28. Talking to his sheep that know his voice, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And again, it means never, ever perish, double negative. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, this is so important. If you are simply a church goer, I'm glad you're here, but don't. Please don't mislabel yourself as a Christian. You're not a Christian because you go to church. You're not a Christian because you own a Bible. You're only a Christian if you have Jesus Christ dwelling within you. You're born again by the Spirit of God. You're only a Christian if Jesus is truly your Lord and Savior. Don't fool yourself. Because I go to church, or like my mom, because I know the Apostles' Creed, or there's a million things. Don't put your faith in those million things. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And if you do, Jesus promises you he will save you. He will forgive you of all of your sins. He will give you the free gift of eternal life. For the rest of us, I would say this, you know, it's not about our name. It's not about our past. It's not about our talents, but it's all about our present relationship with Jesus. And are we yielding ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit day by day, moment by moment, as a Christian today, maybe you're feeling tired, maybe you're feeling worn out, maybe you're feeling spiritually dry. Well, then it's time to come to Jesus once again, not for salvation, but to ask him to refresh you, to refill you, to restore unto you the joy of his salvation. Be filled, be refilled, just like we read in the book of Acts. Being filled, that means an ongoing filling. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says, Don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. When he says be filled, it means be being filled. Continually be filled, because we leak. So humble yourself before him and be refilled. Let's 